uh, and my blogs are usually about on the topics which i learn some you know small tips and tricks which i usually learn while working um and they're pretty useful so i hope you guys go check it out and also like it this apart from that you guys can always find me on any of my social media handles now over to you prasan Hi everyone. Uh, this is Prasen, and uh, I was recognized this year as a double featured author. That was uh, really, really great for me. And I'm a business intelligence analyst, currently working for America Express Global Business Travel. And I founded Tableau Buddy program. And from there, we started this Tableau Buddy talks as well. And apart from that, if I have to say, my life motto is the more I'll share, the more I'll learn. And I'm a total nerd but i'm not only a nerd uh, i enjoy a lot and uh, i love uh, talking about data visualization and anime that that's my main uh, usp i'll say apart from that you can find me uh, every time on linkedin and twitter and i can see pretty much familiar uh, names uh, i've met some of them and uh, i've talked most uh, to some of them like on twitter as well as on linkedin as well so glad to have you here and we'll just start off we won't take much of your time talking all about us so uh, right back to you vani yeah so i am happy to introduce our speakers we're really excited to have both of them first is johanna and right now she is working as a data analytics consultant with the data school down under and uh, today we are going to learn and you know understand how she approaches her with for social good projects and also maybe hopefully implement it uh, in our lives as well and secondly uh, we have kavin right now he is studying engineering in computer science from nanda engineering college and uh, he is also going to talk about how he creates layouts for his tableau dashboards using adobe xd and i'm really excited about this because i've seen his work on tableau public and they are like really crazy with lots of great design so i'm looking forward to hear from you guys and without any further ado over to you johanna it's all yours thank you bani Okay, let me share my screen for a moment. Sure. Yep. Okay. One moment. Um, I'll hide the video panel of this. Yep. All good. So. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think it's evening here. So today I'm going to share about how the approach is for social good projects. So, so first, let's talk about why uh, we're we're talking about oops, why we're we talking about fits for social good in the first place. So there are three unique things uh, for fits for social good compared to other community projects. So first, because it collaborates with nonprofits, so it's always fulfilling to be able to use your skills to volunteer for nonprofits for a good cause. So it's great in its own way. And secondly, it's also open to all tools and expertise levels. And why is it so great? So it's also always one of the best way to learn because when you see everyone working on the same data set, but they all come across with different tools like different bi tools or even different data prep tools you can always learn from each other and you can see oh that's how you, you can approach that in a different way so that's um how you can also learn and because it's also open to expertise uh, to different expertise level I'll, I'll cover that a bit later also so you don't need to be afraid if you're still starting new in oops sorry in fact when i first started i was still very new and fits for social good was my very first uh, community projects in tableau and lastly it's real data real clients so when it comes to real data they're very messy so expect data prepping but because it's also open to all expertise levels so uh what fits for social good project uh the, the team that they have um, already did before is uh like the most recent project that they actually have it's a survey data and what they did is was they already give two data sets so they give the raw one and they also give the one which is already pivoted so it's not that hard compared to the raw one to actually do the data prepping 
and also because it's real clients so it really is a good training for you uh, to build your visualization with keeping the client's purpose and intention in mind so going to the next slide it's very tempting to actually when you're making a vis on Tableau public to think that i want to make a vis that impresses people to make the audience think that i'm smart because of course when it comes to Tableau public it's open to everyone and you can share it to anyone and basically you can pull off really crazy things in Tableau public that you can't do when you're working or on a normal day-to-day -day, uh, activity so it's very tempting to think like that but when it comes to making a visualization which is uh, impactful and also useful for nonprofit maybe it's better if I change my perception so I may want to cross thinking uh, making the audience think that I'm smart but making it's but it's about making the audience feel smarter because now they can understand the data which is very complex that they have and probably they can also get insights so that they can better understand the data and know what to do next and probably they can also use the faces that the volunteers made to go to uh, decision makers to government or even general audience so that they also become more informed and maybe they become uh, compelled to do something to do an action so basically okay so i just um okay this is frederick so i just um posted a, uh, this is a screenshot from his linkedin so basically he's just quoting what the nonprofit said so they just say that oh, it helps them understand the work that they do because now data makes more sense. So that's what we want to do here. So we want to make data easily understandable. And secondly, also making a compelling story so that people want to take action. So before going a bit dive deep into how I approach things, so talking a bit more about myself, aside from what is actually already covered in the in, in, in my bio. So even from in school, I, I like, I like in, analyzing stuff analyzing my marks. Uh, I'm also interested in artsy stuff, so like drawing and other creative pursuits. And when I entered undergrad, I studied business, basically it's management, but I did a bit other stuff also, uh, aside from my uni work. Uh, did quite a bit, uh, no, it's actually not a bit, it's quite a lot. And that's why when I continued my studies in, uh, in masters, I didn't do all this. I think it's really a bit too much. And anyways, the pandemics, it's not the same. So I specialize in business analytics and marketing, but basically it's still under business. And in my final uh, semester, I was thinking what I actually want to do uh, after I graduate. And that's when I finally found Biz for Social Good. And it's only from working on real projects, really a real client. That's only when I get my hands dirty. So that's where I finally know, oh, this is something that I like and something that I want to do after I graduate. So now I already see that, okay, uh, that's the part that I want to take, data analytics and visualization, which is why I highly recommend if um, you're still a student, just go for it because you, it's only from getting your hands dirty, working on projects that you finally know whether you like it or not. And so far, um, you could say the approach that I take um, when approaching this for social good projects, I could credit that mainly to actually uh, my experiences, mainly from debating and business cases actually. So let's go to the main course. So how to approach the data. So I get a, quite a lot of questions usually for this one, because usually when we provided the data set, it's a lot. There's a lot going on there. It's really hard to actually know how do we want to approach this. It's it's just you, you can have a lot of directions here. So it's actually kind of similar to when approaching business cases. And when you're approaching business problems, usually they will scatter around all those problems. This it's just basically like everything is not functioning properly. But if you look at actually a bit more at that, it's actually 
these problems are very tiny. They're, they're actually small, but there's a lot. And if you try to address and answer all these problems, you're at the end of the day, you're just going to, uh, you're just going to have a very surface layer answer. So what you want to do is you want to dig into this little tiny problems even deeper, and then you find a common theme um, for all this. And from there, you can group them and you can find the main problem. Because oftentimes the problem is quite hidden. It's quite hidden. So you want to know what is actually being required. So let's take a look at uh, the website. So here we see this is one of the example this one. So this is one of the project for Fist for Social Good. So this is for Build Up Nepal. So if you see here, this is just a bit of an introduction here. So one of the things that we can see, so this one, it's pretty straightforward actually what they want to search. So in here, we have to see the key impact metrics. So the bare minimum that we need to cover is this four. But then why do we need to visualize this key impact metrics? What's the purpose behind this one? So for this, we can see, oh, okay, so they, they built this because they want to communicate there to the stakeholders. But why? Why do I want to, what do they actually want to do by uh, showing this impact? So they want to elevate the conversation about this safe, hygienic housing, rural areas, and prioritizing lost small infrastructure. So we know we need to cover this one. So if you want to add additional data or additional information, so we want to make sure that this additional data actually adds value, but adds value to what? Adds value to the main purpose that we want to uh, aim for, so this one. So how do we want to show this one? Probably we can add um, additional data about why uh, this is so important, why safe hygienic housing is so important, probably by saying, oh, right now it's not uh, like only a certain proportion of people actually only have uh, safe housing in rural areas and and other stuff. So, so because sometimes people when they add information, it's sometimes it's not um, that relevant. So let's go back to the slide. So, so another thing that may that can actually be put into consideration is the format. So by thinking about the format, so this is how the nonprofit is going to be able to use them. So first is the presentation format. You can so if it's already in presentation format, so the nonprofit can easily use them just straight away as a presentation deck. Or maybe you want to go with infographic style, maybe a bit like poster that also works, or maybe a report style. So maybe a bit more into the analytical side and a bit more corporate-ish. So that's also another way that you can think about um, how you want to approach your uh, visualization. And then also, you can also think how broad you want it to be. So Thinking about this, you can focus on maybe just a brief one. Like let's say if you're going for infographic, you can go with a brief overview. So it's short, a more of a summarized version because sometimes people don't want to go into the details. But on the other side, you can also go with a more detailed one or maybe even a more narrow one. So when it comes to narrow, let's go back again to this one, to the website. So for this one, so this one is another project. So this one is the community survey for this for social good. So for this one, we can see that, okay, this is a bit of information. So we just need to search for the keywords. So what is what is the intention of this purpose of this, um, this visualization? So from here we can see, okay, it's to help the this for social good diversity and inclusion efforts. So, and then another one we can see, okay, lay a strong foundation. And this one, recruiting as well as what nonprofits will be. So, for this one, that's why when I made this visualization, I was focusing on only how I could focus um, to improve the diversity and inclusion efforts. There's a lot of ways to approach this. Of course, you can go a bit more comprehensive, showing all the results of the survey. But in other ways, you can only sell, you can also select only the data that you find can be important to support your direction. So, secondly, you adding context to the numbers. So, how you can add context to these numbers is you can add, of course, brief introduction about the nonprofit, because of course, if you don't 
tell anything about what this nonprofit does or probably what it is actually aiming for, what is its vision. Sometimes a bit of history also works because sometimes history is connected to its vision. So by if someone doesn't know about that much about that nonprofit, then of course they won't be taking any action or supporting that cause. And the problem statement, so this is basically just saying, oh, this is what current what is currently happening and what's the problem right now. So by showing this problem statement, you're giving that connection. So what the nonprofit is doing is addressing this problem. So it gets gives the additional value to the work that the nonprofit is doing. And another reason why problem statement is very important is it adds that urgency for people to take action. Because people are just, um, often people when they know that it's a problem, they just think, okay, that's great to know. But most likely they will think, okay, I will probably do something tomorrow or probably I'll take action next week. So by giving this problem, showing what's the current situation, how urgent it is, then it's only then people are likely to take action. So when it comes to this problem statement, so it's usually giving that general statistics, usually like let's say maybe if the nonprofit is addressing, uh, maybe helping people um, like addressing poverty, then maybe you wanna show uh, the statistics of poverty in that country. So. For this one, usually sometimes the nonprofits already provide the additional links to additional resources. Otherwise, you can always do your research. So usually the common one are usually the government statistics uh, websites. That's one of the uh, common resource and also probably WHO, that's also common. So another one, why um, how you can add context to the numbers is by adding a comparison. Because by adding comparison, you can know how good or how bad is the number. So I'll just give a, an example from my uh, most recent list. So this is the suicide death rate for Tanzania, but I, I'm, I'm only isolating it only to Tanzania. So from here we can see, yeah, it's, it seems to be increasing over the years. That's not really a good thing, but we don't know. Um, is it a good thing? Is it? Um, is it that is still okay-ish compared to maybe other countries. If let's say other countries are uh, also uh, having this increasing trend, but are even at a steeper rate, then probably Tanzania isn't that bad actually. So only by adding this, so now we add Africa, now we can see that, oh, this doesn't seem good because Africa before the year 2017, although the suicide rate is actually higher, but after 2017, it has now uh, switched over. So that's not really good because the current trend is actually what's more, more important, right? And if we, we can even add another layer again and add another context to the story after we add the world wide rate. Right? So from this one, we see that, oh, okay, the world has always been at a higher rate, so, it's not that bad. But then if you see over the trend over the time, the trend has been downward. So the world rate is improving, but not for Tanzania. So that's why it's very important to actually take action now, because we're assuming that this trend will continue to persist. And that's why this adds the additional meaning and layer uh, to the story. So. Why does context matter? So first, it adds meanings to these numbers. If you just throw away all those numbers straight away to the audience, they don't really see why they actually need to care about those numbers. And even if they know these numbers, they don't really know whether it's actually good or not. And the thing when it comes with numbers, numbers are hard, uh, hard logic. They're just numbers at the end. It taps into the logical side. But if you add this context, this story, this meaning to it, so now these numbers also taps into your, the feeling side of the person. So it's only when you combine this logical and feeling side that it becomes more compelling. 
And another reason why context is also very important is, whoops, is also it adds, um, it does the progression. So it's kind of like, um, like movies. When it comes to movies, usually they don't go straight away to the action, to the, the action, to the main tension. They build the events eventually until it builds up, until it reaches that that uh, really, you could say the action. Okay, the, the more, the most fun part of the movie, they build it up. Although there are movies that start with the, yeah, with, with maybe the chasing and then the car chasing straight away at the beginning. And that's usually where the part where you don't understand what's actually going on. And it's only then after that, they usually take a flashback and then start from the scene, how it can actually envelop into that scene. So it's kind of like giving the flow so that you build the progression and build a good story. So you want to just introduce your audience bits by bits before finally introducing the numbers. So now we've already talked about the context. Now you want to go to the visualization. But before you jump into your visualization, you need to check your data first. And when in doubt, you can always ask and clarify because we're in here we are working with nonprofits, so they're real people. We can have the opportunity to ask questions. So Fist for Social Good, they have Slack channel, so you can always ask questions to the nonprofits. You can clarify everything. There's no such thing as dumb questions. Or you can even ask other volunteers if you're struggling to and you're stuck with something. You can always ask questions. And there are even volunteers who, who also share their resources if they uh, found something interesting or something that they found can be useful for other people. So I know I'm skipping a bit actually here. So I'm skipping the choice of graphs, but in here, I wanna focus the design more on the branding of the organization. So branding is just basically just saying how the personality of the organization is if that nonprofit is a person. So some nonprofit will have stronger branding and some not really. So when it comes to stronger branding, so that means they are more particular when it comes to maybe their color palette, their tone, uh, in their communication, and maybe their font. So this kind of things. And some other are not really that strong. And that may possibly suggest that you can have a bit more creative freedom when it comes to those uh, choices. And how do you identify whether this nonprofit uh, have a stronger branding or not? So it's usually from looking at how consistent that design is in their publication and also in their websites and other things. So there are also another um, way how you can see it. So of course, if the nonprofit already have a brand guideline, so that's definitely means that they just have a strong branding. And yes, I can give you an example. So one of the project, they even uploaded a brand guideline. So that's really a major hint that they're, they have a very strong branding. And an another one, if let's say, so uh, let's say for an another one, there's also nonprofits which have a strong branding, but they don't provide the, the guideline. So what you can do with for this kind of um, this kind of um, okay, let, let me change my okay, this one. So another one which is actually I I I think it's pretty strong in terms of the color palette and everything is actually is for social good, but then they don't provide the brand guideline. So for this one, how we can if let's say we don't get this one. It's actually very easy for you to pick the colors. So let's just take that view here. So what we can do here, so we can just edit the color. Uh, let's go with this one. So it's very easy. We can just pick a screen color straight away from Tableau and we can pick anything here. So in here, we already get the color palette from just the website straight away. So that's one of the way. So now we get this really nice color palette. But from here, we only know the color. So another way that if you want to use the font, you can just inspect, do inspect. So this is, just ignore this. You can just go for this one. 
the left one and then just click on this one and it will show all the information here so you can know the font that is used even the font size and everything and also in here so you can own after that you can just google it the font and you can download it but just keep in mind that some font have different licenses and they may not be free for personal or commercial use so just make sure before you download and make um, use yeah use it for your visualization just make sure that the licenses are uh, yeah free for personal and commercial use so that's one of the way if you want to make a visualization which already cater to the personality or the branding of that nonprofit so that it's very easy for them to just use it straight away so now going with colors under design for nonprofits so when it comes to color they they have certain associations that people just intuitively already perceive like if you see red you just know oh it's, it's uh, bold it's aggressive and often when it comes with color it have more than one association like let's say black black in one way it can be seen as cool classy but at other times it can also be perceived as something which is negative which is dark and gloomy and hopeless so association can also change according to the topic that we use with that color so i'm going to give you a bit of an example so here we see this is a very dark color but because the Writing here, it's just new year, new class. So I'm assuming that this may be an advertisement for a new car maybe. So it's something a bit more classy. But if you compare to this one, when you add this topic here, I don't see anything which is cool or classy here. What I'm seeing, it's a bit depressing. It's a bit sad. It's So the tone here is a bit more negative. It really depends, of course, um, for the intention of your face, what kind of emotions that you want to evoke from um, your visualization. But sometimes there are nonprofits, even though they're actually addressing this kind of sensitive topics about the serious issues, but they want to be seen as the warm personality. They want to be seen as providing some hope. And sometimes they may not really like the darker colors so it really depends and something that you just need to want to consider when you're building your biz. So another thing that also when you want to uh, ensure when it comes to the design is it's always great, of course, to make a beautiful biz, but let's not, but let's try not to go um, to make, uh, to do those kind of things at the expense of accessibility. Because this, when you're making the biz for nonprofit, you, may want to make it um, to be um, for the general audience and you don't want to exclude anyone so one of the thing is of course the font size so usually the text and the tooltip often people forget to format the tooltip and the default one is very tiny actually and another one is contrast check so what you can check in the contrast check so one of the way uh, this is called color Adobe. So it just basically measures the difference between the background and the text here. So we see here that this orange brown color, it passed for the 18 point and above, but not the small one. It's a bit harder to read. And you can always play around. This one definitely, this is, yeah, this is going to fail. This is really bad. So let's go back. So that's one of the way that you can check the contrast. And another way that you can also, um, the, another one you, that you want to check also is usually the color blindness. So color blindness is actually more common than, uh, than what most people think. It's, I forget the numbers, but it's a lot. So in here, you can also see that, oh, this is a very similar color. If people have this kind of color blindness, they will see that this and this one are very similar. So you may want to change this color because otherwise they may not differentiate uh, the different meaning that you use in your visualization. So just another thing to keep in mind. So let's go back. So lastly, you already made your base. So you just want to have another 
final check. So because it's using it, because it's intended to be communicated to audience that may not necessarily never even touch Tableau before. So you may want to see your base again from seeing from a third person lens, seeing it from the view of that person. And then, but then there's a limit to how you can see that. So you may also want to ask for feedback. So there are usually two types of feedback. So the first one is the experience one. People are already experienced in data visualization. So for this kind of people, you can straight away ask them how they would have approached this. But the second one is the inexperienced one. So this is where your friends or family come into. So they are the people who are very similar to your intended audience or user. But when it comes to this, your friends or family, it's probably better don't ask, don't ask them to think about how to improve it. It actually reminds me of my friend. She's good in designing and she want to ask for feedback for a design. And my friend who doesn't have any background in design, what he suggested is, oh, why don't you just add more colors to it? Why don't you add red, green, yellow, and all those bright colors? Which maybe in design sense, in visualization sense may not be the best. So for this kind of people, you just ask them to use it, navigate it, and speak out loud what they're thinking. So like, let's say, oh, I want to go to this drag down button because I want to change the year. So you know, oh, okay, that's how that person thinks and how they interact with your visualization. And you just need to observe. And the, and the other two things that you just want to know from this is whether it's intuitive and it's easily understandable. So just to sum things a bit up. So because it's general audience, you want to keep things very simple. And rather than putting the um, emphasis on myself thinking about making a visualization, which is um, cool. Of course, it's nice to always make a, a cool visualization. But the primary reason here is making a visualization which is useful for a nonprofit. Although, of course, if you can make it cool, that's a bonus. So, and then after that, when approaching problem, uh, there's a lot of different approaches. And you can start with a hypothesis question, which is from the project brief, or you can always um, go from another different approach, like seeing how it's going to be intended, like in terms of the format. And again, when it comes to design, take into consideration the personality of the nonprofit and how color also plays a very important element. So thank you for listening and feel free to connect with me. So this is just the link. You can even scan the QR code. So this will link to my Twitter and LinkedIn. So thank you. That was a really great uh, presentation as well as uh, I think we got so many uh, tips and also how actually we should proceed with a best for social good project because there is a social co cause associated with it and we need to think about in terms of context, in terms of what should be added and what should be not in terms of what color selection should be there. So uh, I think it, it was very well defined, Johanna, and thank you so much for sharing this whole process with us. I think we can talk a lot more about it, how you have uh, started this and how you actually took it forward. And there's a whole process that you defined. So uh, thank you so much for sharing this all with us. I think uh, this will really help others. Maybe even, even we can share with more people around the community so that people can engage with this for social, social good projects. So uh, I wouldn't... Uh, take much of a time uh, again and let's just uh, shift it to Kevin who will be talking about creating layouts for Tableau dashboards with Adobe XD. So Kevin, uh, sorry. I'm going to share my screen. Hello, hello everyone. I'm going to share about 
creating layouts for Tableau dashboard using Adobe XD. Before that, let me introduce myself. I am Kamin Kumar Ji. I am studying Computer Science Engineering, Nanda Engineering College. I am passionate about turning data into engaging visualization using Tableau. I am featured on Tableau Next Core 2020 in Adam Eco's blog. I am also interested in UI UX wireframing and prototyping of website and mobile application. I got 2x VOTD wish of the day that were featured in Tableau Public Waste Gallery. Now, why Adobe XD for Tableau dashboard layouts? The interface simplicity speed up onboarding. It is relatively easy to learn. Designing and navigating artboards, Adobe XD canvas is visibly faster. Exporting graphic elements into IE visualization, .png or any other image format is easy. There are so many plugins in Adobe XD, but I use some plugins, custom export icon for design, and and the angle are frequently used with these plugins. Now, steps to make layout using Adobe XD. Set the dashboard size that matches your dashboard size. Create a layout using shapes and the font types. Export the layout image and then import the layout image in Tableau as a dashboard image and then arrange the charts in their response place. Now, we are going to create a New file here. I can set the customers custom size. Can change the change the title. Background color to black. Here you can see that there are so many tools like rectangle, ellipse, polygon, line, and pen tool. Now I'm going to create a title. Change the font style, compatibility, change the font color, and yeah, Change the color to right items. It was seven. White and red. We add a mix.
and we'll create a box for the paragraph cap. And then I'm going to create subtitle. And then I'm going to create a search bar, Google search bar, like a design. I'll just unshuffle from the edges. After creating a layout like this, you get like this one. After creating like this, we need to export this image. Like by here, export and then click selected. You can export it. Uh, there are so many format. You can download as a PGN or SPG PDF. But my suggestion is you want to download a plugin, Adobe XD, search a custom export plugin. Here, we have already installed it. Now, start the plugin, I change the scale size, and then I export it. Now, I went to Tableau. Here, I already created charts. Oh, I create a new dashboard and set the size that matches the dashboard layout size. I change into floating and then I insert the image in the dashboard. Now set the values x and y as 0. And change the value here also. Then 
we need to arrange the charts here. Like this. We need to format the color and remove the color from this worksheet color. After arranging this chart, we need to remove the boxes behind the charts. Like this. We need to remove the boxes. And then export it again. This is the image. Okay. Here, I click to edit the image. We are doing like this. Can get like this visualization. It won't see them. Here, I already created a paragraph for this and I arrange this in charts. So the steps, editing layout using Adobe XD, we did it. And this is the final layout. After placing the charts in Tableau, it looks like this. These are my uh, dashboard layouts that I created for my visualization. I have created so many dashboard layouts for my visualization. And thank you. Thank you for the opportunity for Tableau Buddy Talks team. Thank you so much, Kavan. It was a great presentation. Thanks. I just want to ask you one thing. Uh, do you use Figma? Have you ever used Figma? I use Figma, but but I don't like that uh, like much that uh, uh, Adobe XD. I like this one because of this user friendly to me. And it is lent to easy to me. Is so there like a you know a particular difference that you have found when you use Figma and Adobe XD? Because we want to know why you know you chose this over Figma because a lot Figma is much more popular these days. Um, I, I in my lockdown days I, I need to learn uh, the UI UX designing. Okay. So I started uh, watching tutorial YouTube tutorials. Uh, I, I watch so many Adobe XD tutorial videos, so I like that. So I learned this software. Okay. That was really cool and really a quick way to make a very beautiful dashboard. <laughs> I need to stop designing in Tableau more and use these design tools more now. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, for you, Kevin, uh, because uh, the templates uh, that you are building. So uh, yeah. what's the thought process? How do you go around it? Because uh, the whole story doesn't come up in one setting, right? And First, that's many of us uh, must be thinking like, 
how everything came at a picture in at one time but this is not something that actually happens so what's your thought process if you can uh, like in brief in one to two minutes if you can i just i first i uh, i draw in my uh, notebook how to create a design first i just uh, take my pencil and i'm just draw how can i uh, arrange the charts uh, what elements i want to add in my designs and then uh, i use adobe xd for the designing and then i uh, place the charts for the visualization i love more design more than analysis so i love to design great great i also uh, first thing is to jot down all the things and yeah. draw it out on the notebook go the traditional way that that's that's really good and i also love the, your trick like i actually i go for the image as a uh, fixed uh, not floating but yeah. i like your way just setting it to floating set the x y to zero it's very slick and very quick fix so thank you for sharing us thanks thank you thank you guys if you have any questions uh, we'll be happy to answer Uh, yes, Rohan, you can uh, add yourself to the Slack channel for Whisper Social Good. Um, Johanna, do you have a link uh, handy or know where we can find the link for the Slack channel? Yes, Uh, cool. I'll actually send the link for the Slack channel uh, along with the recording to all of you. All right. Thank you so much for the link, Johanna.